And then I'll share the screen. Okay. So before we proceed with the discussion of uh, topic 10, so imagine we're now in topic 10. Uh, we've only got just one topic more to go, which is on the freedom of information, which we discuss uh, next week. And then that's it. So, uh, yeah, it's a good thing that you've always been joining uh, the tutorial sessions. Now, before we start talking about this, would there be anything else you may wish to discuss or you might have any questions? No? So we will proceed, proceed. Okay, so after studying this topic, you should be able to discuss and explain the distinction between common law or prerogative judicial remedies and equitable judicial remedies, judicial review remedies and then uh, be able to discuss and explain the specific common law prerogative, judicial remedies of certiorari, mandamus, prohibition, and habeas corpus, as well as the specific equitable judicial remedies of declaration and injunction, and then the statutory uh, judicial remedies. So uh, let's begin. Can I ask someone to read the discussion question for us? Oh, my connection is unstable. Okay, um, can anyone, can anyone, um, hold on, what's going on? Can anyone read the question for us? I'm happy to read it for you. Please. Counting tasks on his own. An audit by the Australian Taxation Office revealed that he had misinterpreted key provisions of the Australian tax laws and as a result was deficient in the payment of taxes in the amount of $59,965. The ATO informed him that under the relevant tax laws he must pay his tax deficiency within 15 days or it would garnish all his business and personal bank funds. Darren has come to you as a solicitor for advice. Advise Darren on the judicial remedy or remedies that are suitable to prevent the garnishment. Can anyone hear Manjo? No, he's muted again. Manjo, you're muted. Okay, sorry. I was actually saying earlier that I kind of dropped out all of a sudden. I seem to have problems with my internet, but hopefully it doesn't happen again. So I think, yeah, you should have, you would be able to hear me by now. I was able to hear you actually, Janet. Now, so what I'd like you to do is provide what you think is a the judicial remedy that's available and then um, if you could explain why you think it is available so not just the judicial remedy that's available or whether or not it is available but this uh, why you think it is available Okay, so from Josh, it's prohibition. From Matt, it's prohibitory injunction. And from Janet, 
it's prohibition. Okay, but I'd like to know why you think um, prohibition or prohibitory injunction might be a possible judicial remedy. Why? Andrew, are we assuming that um, all of the facts of the case prove him as being uh, guilty and in need of remedy? Let me think about that. Because um, if... Would, would it guess, matter? Let's assume that... Um, we, we can make an assumption, though, that um, Darren is actually prepared to dispute the amount of the assessment because he thinks it's less than that. So assuming that's the case. So we can make the assumption that um, Darren is prepared to dispute the assessment made by the AT ATO. So what, 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 what do you think? So from Janet, uh, was there a denial of procedural fairness? Okay. So b before we talk about um, judicial remedies, what is, what is it that we need to establish first? Before we start talking about judicial remedies, what, it, what is it that needs to be established first? That there's been a wrong? That there's a need for a remedy? Uh, no, that's kind of too broad. Okay. <laughs> what, what is it that you need to show um, if you apply for judicial review? Do you go straight away to trying to examine what the judicial remedies are? When do you begin? What is the first question you need to ask? What do you want to happen? What objective? Uh, what do you want to achieve with the court? That would be that would be almost similar as a remedy. What would it be? Before you can apply for judicial review, what what do you need to think about first? If you were the lawyer, because you're meant to be the lawyer here, would you just straight away say, okay, fine, we can apply for prohibition or prohibitory injunction? And we'll try to look into the distinction between the two in a short while. But uh, in the meantime, uh, the basic question I'd like to ask is, do you begin by talking about judicial remedies? Or is there something else we might be missing if you were to be the lawyer? Remember, we're now at, we, we are now at week 11, so what needs to happen, especially in the context of a, the, written, the final written online assessment, you're meant to be bringing in all your knowledge about and understanding of administrative law. So previously, it was possible for us as in weeks three and four to just ignore a discussion of you know, specific judicial remedies, for example, or whether or not you know, there was a remedy to uh, apply to the Ombudsman or apply on the basis of the Freedom of Information Act. We could ignore that in week three because we, were, we had not covered those yet. But because we're now in week 11, the assumption is, and especially in the context of the final written online assessment, you have to bring to bear everything that you know or understand about the topic of administrative law and even perhaps constitutional law to an extent. So in other words, what we need to happen is you must be able to identify all the potential legal issues. So in other words, if you just look at it from the viewpoint of, um, so even if, even if the question seems to be quite specific and quite limiting, what you need to do is to go beyond that and figure out you know, what else, what, what are the other legal issues that I need to address here before I actually answer this specific question. Okay. So, are you asking us to are you asking us to go beyond what the question specifically an, uh, requests? In that sense, yes. Uh, in, in other words, you know, okay. if you say, for example, that the judicial remedy that uh, you should seek 
is one of prohibition or prohibitory injunction, what needs to be established before we start talking about judicial remedies? What, need, what do you need to show? Which is very critical here. Are you looking for basically? Assuming this were a final written online assessment, and that's the way I crafted the question, how exactly will you address it? Will you address it by directly answering and saying, you know, prohibition or prohibitory injunction, and then you, you discuss why that is so, why you think it should be prohibition, or why it should be prohibitory injunction? So I'm repeating, I'd like to again make the emphasis, I'd like to emphasize that, especially in the context of uh, the final written online assessment, and for the purpose of the week 10 topic, it should be, your answers should be more thorough and more encompassing because otherwise you'll end up just giving an answer you know which is good for two two paragraphs that cannot happen at this point it's you know you need to be able to discuss a few things here which is missing there are certain important things that are missing what is it so are you, is one of the questions whether he's actually whether there's grounds, so whether the judicial review is even yes, thought absolutely, very good. So that's the need, the first thing you need to okay. establish before we can even talk about the specific judicial remedy. So, in other words, you know, if it, as any good lawyer will do, you don't you don't um, give the legal advice on the basis of the way that the your client um, frames the question or frames the problem. Your client may say. You know, let's assume that it's about marriage and all the client does is to start talking about, oh, my problem is about child custody. And then he wants to know, you know, we need to do this, we need to do that. But actually, if you're a lawyer, you begin to wonder, okay, are there property relations issues involved here? Is there a potential for a domestic violence order? So things that your client, because that client is a layman, is unlikely to be thinking, but if you are a lawyer, you bring to four all the you know the knowledge that you might have on the law so in this case at least uh that's you correct josh we begin by asking is there a ground for judicial review or to even extend it further do we discount an administrative review and why would we do that so let me repeat hold on I'm sorry, I just want to clarify something here. So there, th that makes the difference between a, um, a credit answer where you just answer on the basis of what the assessment is asking you. But a high distinction answer would go beyond the question that's being asked, but still addresses the question, even if somehow the question uh, did not directly ask for a, for a particular answer. That would be an HD answer. Okay, so like, ooh, you know, you're, you're surprised. The answer is just so soft, you, it's just so thorough. So, in a sense, we're kind of, um, at this point, we're kind of um, doing a bit of a review or a revision, although this is not a revision tutorial yet, but kind of uh, providing a review of uh, the other topics that we previously discussed in the past. So. You know, the first question that we need to be asked is, why not administrative review? Why not, you know, um, judicial review? Would it be available? Okay, can somebody say something? Oh, my internet connection is unstable. Not good. Was that warning for me or for somebody else? I'm dropping in and out here. Yeah, I'm getting, and, uh, I'm getting a warning as well. Okay. Um, before we talk about the judicial review aspect first, just as a matter of uh, kind of a review, why not an administrative review? Yeah. 
because the decision was made based on the law as it stood. So, no, actually, Go I on. don't know. No, you're headed, you're headed no, in the correct direction there. Um, Can I have a shot at that? Yes, Janet, please. Sorry, Josh. Um, look, I'm going back to the basics where there was a decision mm. um, that, that the person is aggrieved by the decision, Section 5 of the ADJR. Mm. The decision is of an administrative character, Section 3, Subsection 1. Yes. The decision was made. Um, under a specific enactment identified by the Act or by a Commonwealth authority yes. or an officer of a Commonwealth. Is mm. that what you mean? Mm. Going back to that? Mm. Not exactly. In fact, the, the basic question I would like to ask when you raise the ADJR Act is why are we even citing that? I mean, why are you limiting it on the ADJR Act? Are you suggesting that that is the basis on which you will file an application for judicial review, the ADJR Act, or are there other legal uh, grounds on which you can apply for judicial review outside of the ADJR Act? But that's, you know, but that's a different point. We're gonna go back to that in a short while, okay? But I'm going back to that basic question, why not uh, an administrative review or a merits review. Why not go to the AAT? We assume here that uh, the AAT actually has uh, jurisdiction over tax matters. It's, it has a tax division. If, if this was um if this had an enactment that it could go to the AAT, then it could go there to look at all of the facts. Mm -hmm. And sorry, I'm a bit brain dead. Um, and possibly put a case forward to state that it was unreasonable or unfair to have a look at all of the facts of the case. Mm -hmm. It was, after all, um, a misinterpretation, not a deliberate act. Mm -hmm. So under natural justice, it would be fair for Darren Wilkins to be able to state his case to uh, the AAT. Hold on, I'm just flagging, you know, what you said there. Okay. Yeah. Mis, uh, taken misinterpretation, yes. Okay, and then you mentioned something about enactment, Janet. Uh, can you be more specific here? Are we speaking of the same- Providing- th Are we speaking of the same thing? Sorry. Are we speaking of the same enactment? Whether we talk about- The enactment. Uh, you and a, under the ADGR Act or not? Is that, are we speaking of the same enactment? Yes, that's the enactment that I'm talking about. There has to be that enactment to enable um, yeah. an administrative review through the AAT. If that is not there, then that is not an option that is available to Mr. Wilkins. Very good. And what kind of enactment are we talking about in relation to the, the ADJR Act? Is it an enactment that provides... Merit review. For a merit review. I mean, when you speak of the enactment, is it an enactment which provides that uh, an administrative decision that is covered by the ADHR Act uh, must be uh, maybe subject to judicial review under the ADJR Act? Is that what we mean by enactment? Yes, it has to state that. It has to have an enactment stating that the AAT is available as a merit review process for, for a decision. Okay, thank you. Um, you. You said that, thanks. But my question was, in relation to judicial review, in particular in relation to the ADJR Act, are we similarly stating that the enactment similar to the AAT Act must also provide that the uh, 
enactment must provide that the administrative decision is subject to review under the ADJR Act. Must, they, must the um, enactment on which Hold on. Okay, I just got, got, got cut off. Sorry about that, I lost the inter internet connection. So the, the point I was raising was, must the, for, for, for somebody to be able to apply for judicial review under the ADJR Act, must the enactment uh, that was the basis for an administrative decision provide that uh, the, the judicial review under the ADGR Act is available? No. Uh, yeah, I don't recall that being. Okay. So what exactly is the requirement for judicial review under the ADGR Act? So remember what we're trying to do now is, you know, going back into the details because if all we do is just to answer the question, uh, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't lend much for discussion. We, we, we need to kind of get our heads back to wrap around the key concepts in administrative law at this time. Uh, hello, Ali. So what exactly was the requirement as far as the ADGR Act is concerned? So as I said, this is kind of a part of a revision process because I don't want to just go straight to the answer and say, you know, this is what we do. This is the, you know, this is the, the remedy that's available. It'll be too limiting. So I'd like us to be uh, more comprehensive in, in answering that question at this point because we're now in week 11. What exactly is the requirement under the ADJR Act? The requirement has four points that I've got here. Yeah. There must be a decision. The decision must be of an administrative character. The decision must be made under an enactment and the decision must not be an excluded decision. Very good. So is there a requirement that uh, the enactment must provide for the availability of judicial review under the ADJR Act? Is there such a requirement? The answer is? Is that a no or is it's a, it's a no? I can't see Janet, I can't see Ali. Matt, I can't see your answer. And I, was that a yes or a no? Basic question. In the chat box, you could, no. Okay, good. So there is no requirement. Oh, Ali did get the question. Okay, that's fine. Um, the answer is no. There is no requirement that the enactment on which the administrative decision was uh, was made uh, must provide that judicial review is available under the ADHR Act. There is no such requirement. If, for as long as it is an administrative decision and it's based on an enactment, it is not one of those excluded decisions, then judicial review is available. So let's be clear about that. Now, so going back to the point, oh, hold on, I lost the share screen. So, um, going back, I, I want to address this point first about what Janet was saying about misinterpretation, therefore natural justice. I kind of heard a connection there. Justice, um, Janet, are they one and the same? Sorry, can you repeat that? Um, earlier, when you were giving your answer, you kind of said something about mis misinterpretation and then natural justice. As, as like, because of the misinterpretation, that was my, my reading, my, the way I heard it, because of the misinterpretation, therefore, there was a breach of natural justice. In other words, is there a connection between the two, based on the facts, or are they even the same? Was I correct in making... Because it, it was an honest... Yeah, Janet, go on. Because it was an honest mistake, 
-hmm. that he had misinterpreted it. It wasn't deliberate. Therefore, it wasn't fraud. Therefore, it's actually not available for the ADJR for a, for a judicial review. It would appear to me that he has got a right to be have his case heard through the merits review process to look for a different decision. Okay, for now... Um, to, to appeal that decision. Okay, so for now we'll just step, uh, you know, we're going to set aside for now the discussion on um, the... Although I'll, I'll go back to that in a short while. I'm just going to pursue the uh, judicial review angle here. But the, the question I had was, um, was I correct in interpreting what you said that because of a possible misinterpretation that amounted to a breach of natural, natural justice. So therefore, that is your legal ground for a judicial review under the AD, ADJR Act. In other words, are they the same, misinterpretation and natural justice, are they the same ground? Or are they two different grounds? Is misinterpretation a ground? Uh, good question. And that brings us to the administrative law, to the merits review aspect. When a law has been misinterpreted, what is the legal implication of that? Um, I would say that you'd have, would be subject to the, you'd have to take responsibility for your choices. Um, like, Mm -hmm. If you misinterpret something and you act on that misinterpretation and then end up doing something that is okay. acting on the wrong advice or blah, 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 you still have to take responsibility for your actions and okay. bear the consequences thereof. Okay, very good. What if it was his assertion that the misinterpretation was actually that by the ATO? Would it make a difference? I believe so. Yes. What would the difference? What would the difference be? The difference would be that the decision maker did not uh, make his decision based on the provisions of the enactment Therefore, by which the decision was purported to be made under. Therefore, what kind of question? Therefore, decision. What kind of question? Therefore, are you dealing with in that case? If it were based on an allegation by Mr. Wilkins that there was a misinterpretation of the law by the ATO. We're changing the facts, remember? Sorry, can you restate the question? So let me repeat the question. If the allegation of Mr. Wilkins is that the ATO misinterpreted the law to his detriment, in that case, uh, what kind of question are we dealing with? Is it legal? Is it factual? And in relation to that, um, assuming that merits review were actually available, would merits review be the appropriate remedy or appropriate recourse, or would it be judicial review based on a claim that the ATO misinterpreted the law? I, I agree with Ali, who says it's illegal, therefore judicial. Well done. So that is something we need to remember. If the question becomes, very good, Ali, and thank you, Josh, that's very good. Um, if the point being raised is that there was a misinterpretation of the law, you don't go to the, um, to the AAT. It becomes, because it's a legal question this time, meaning you, you're questioning the legality of the law, then your recourse has to be to the courts. Because uh, in the case of customs, uh, the Commissioner of Customs New South Wales versus Brian Lawler Automotive, although in the course of a merits review, it is possible to examine incidentally the question of legality of a decision. In the end, uh, it's still mainly a, a question of determining whether or not the decision made by the original decision maker was the correct or preferable decision. It is never a question of determining the legality itself of the decision, which is 
uh, solely in the jurisdiction of the courts, or chapter three courts in particular. Okay, so that was clarified. Now, so assuming that it is natural justice that we are basing the, uh, the application for judicial review, what are the possible legal basis for judicial review? Or the sources of um, an application for judicial review? Obviously, one of them is the ADJR Act. Is there any others apart from that? I, I think the natural justice provision would be a way because he's basically paying for a consequence, consequences of something that he didn't do. Okay. Yeah. So here, natural justice is the ground for judicial review. Okay. My question is, what law um, or what legal basis or what source of law can you rely upon in order to apply for judicial review? I'm no longer asking about the legal ground. The legal ground is there. We're speaking of a breach of natural justice. And the question now is, is it just going to be the ADGR Act, which is the sole legal, the source of legal authority on which you can ground an application for judicial review? Or would there be others? Manjo, are you getting at the concepts of fairness as well? No, a fairness would be would go back to the issue of ground. I'm talking of the source of the right, so meaning the legal source. So one of the legal sources which gives you the, 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 the right to apply for judicial review is the ADPR Act. Would there be any other source that gives you the right to apply for judicial review outside of the ADJR Act? Would the decision of uh, what I was actually referring to? Natural justice. No, that, that's still the ground. What I was actually referring to is that you can you, you can apply for uh, judicial review outside of the ADHR Act on the basis of the uh, common law or prerogative uh, powers of the courts of in relation to judicial review. Or it could be again in relation to the power of the courts to dispense with equitable remedies, or it could be on the basis of the constitutional writs under section 75, uh, subsection five of the Australian constitution, or it could be under the Judiciary Act of 1903, particular section 39B. Uh, 39B. Okay, so in other words, it's not just the ADGR Act, which can be the legal source for a judicial review. You can have a constitutional writ, which is section 75, subsection five of the constitution, which gives the high court the original jurisdiction uh, in relation to matters involving the issuance of writs of mandamus, prohibition, and injunction. And uh, similar to that provision is section 39B of the Judiciary Act of 1903, which gives the Federal Court of Australia the same power to issue in matters uh, which involve the issuance of a writ of mandamus, prohibition, and injunction, which also provides under Section 43 the power of the High Court to remit uh, any matter which has been brought to the attention of the High Court and remit it to the Federal, Federal Court of Australia. Now, why is that relevant? Why is it often necessary to ground your application for judicial review, not on the ADGR Act. Would that be because sometimes you don't meet all of the requirements of the ADGR Act? Very good, very good. In particular, very good, go on. In particular, the, uh, the decision, Go on. Very good. You're headed there, Josh. Go on. 
I can't remember. Um, the decision. Put it this way. Put it this way. Um, let's just assume, for the for the sake of a theoretical example, that the ATO um, assessed certain tax deficiencies on Darren Wilkins, but they did not base it on their on any specific law or enactment. Let's just assume that for whatever reason, uh, the treasurer, the the, the, the Commonwealth Treasurer decided that, um, you know, using his own powers as a Minister of the, of the Commonwealth, he issued regulations saying that, you know, um, assessments could be made by the ATO outside of the uh, laws passed by Parliament. Does that make a difference? And what, you know, what exactly am I leading to? You're leading to the point that to apply under the ADRJR Act, you, it has to be a decision made under an enactment. Very good. So in other words, oftentimes, oftentimes, a, uh, an executive decision maker will make a decision not on the basis of an enactment. And if so, it immediately falls outside of the parameters of the ADJR Act, which means you need to be very aware that even if, you cannot have recourse under the ADGR Act. There are other possible avenues. Okay. Again, we're doing this as a matter of kind of a, you know, a, 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 re, a review of sorts. Now, what is the main difference, however, in terms of relief uh, between relief under the ADGR Act and relief, say, under the uh, Constitution or uh, the Judiciary Act of 1903, specifically Section 39B. Or even, uh, you know, common law or prerogative writs or equitable writs. A lot of an interesting question to ask for you to explain all of those. Mm. So your client was saying, ah, I'm getting confused here. Andrew, are you getting at that the in judicial review, the, co the court is restricted in the sort of remedy it can give because it has to simply quash the decision. Uh, whereas if you apply on a different enactment, say constitutional, they have a more broad scope of remedies available to them. Very good. Yes. That's one. Well done. Very good. What else? Very good. What else? That's absolutely correct. What else? How different would, you know, Section uh, 39B of the Judiciary Act of 1903 and uh, Section 75, subsection 5 of the Constitution be from the ADGR Act? So you said that, you know, the problem with the ADGR Act is that all they can do is to either affirm the decision or quash it or set it aside. So, having said that, how about the other potential uh, avenues for judicial review? In particular, the constitutional writs or the statutory enactment based on the Judiciary Act of 1903 or uh, the common law remedies or the equitable remedies. What are the distinctions there? Very good. And that we're now heading now at some point into a distinction between prohibition as opposed to prohibitory injunction because your initial answers were prohibition, some were saying prohibition, some were saying prohibitory injunction as the legal remedy. And we're heading towards that direction now. So what we're doing here is, you know, really digging deep into these concepts where we're going beyond just a simple recitation of what we know, reading off what we can read. This time we're trying to analyze, you know, how, so when you have all of these potential judicial remedies, how do they compare and contrast to each other? Where are the similarities? Where are the distinctions? And why would you want to um, apply for this specific judicial remedy as opposed to this? 
So, um, very good, Josh. You've already said that the ADGR Act judicial remedies are quite limited because they're limited to uh, they're limited one to the either the affirming of the decision or just the quashal or the um, setting aside of the decision, which means that for other judicial remedies, it seems to be that the relief would be broader. Now, can we be more specific this time? And how do they differ? And when, for example, would prohibition be available as a common law remedy as opposed to prohibitory injunction? And what exactly is the difference between the two? Are they one of the one same? One is an, would it be one is an equitable remedy? So an injunction is the, in, within the equitable jurisdiction of the court, whereas a prohibition comes out of a common law statutory sort of uh, the yeah. prerogative writ. Um, well, you can say that, but to me, I mean, it's, it's a good, it's, it's, you know, it's a one way of uh, making the distinction, but it's based on a distinction that is not very important. It's an unimportant distinction. So what? So one is common law. It's a prerogative writ. The other one is an equitable writ. So what? What's the point? Because that's important for us to know whether it's, prohib it's prohibition that is actually the correct remedy here or it's actually prohibitory injunction because there seems to be a disagreement in the class that the, the appropriate remedy is prohibition as opposed to prohibitory injunction, or actually, are they the same? Are they the same? I mean, obviously not. You've already said it's based on... Uh, no, no, they're different. They're different. Okay, tell me how they're different. But don't tell me the answer that they're different because one is common law, the other one is equitable. It doesn't tell me anything. What's the difference? Just in, in relation to that question, the prohibitory injunction uh, to my mind, was something that you'd uh, do to stop the ATO just in the interim while the case was um, heard. So that's, that's it. And I know that the injunction can be permanent, but in, the, in that instance, you'd be looking at... Um, uh, Interlocutory one. A prohibitory, yeah, prohibitory injunction to, to stop them taking further action against you to extend that 15 days. So that you can ad address the underlying problem, the um, the decision that you want to uh, address. So you're actually asking with respect to you're actually asking for an interlocutory prohibitory injunction. Yes, yes. Interlocutory in the in the meantime. No, but the question is, why not prohibition? Andrew, yeah. Are you referring? Are you referring to the, the nature of a prerogative writ in general being for the just being for the purpose of safeguarding the crown and its prerogative against legal non-compliance, as opposed to equitable it's being? No, it's too conceptual for me. If I were to ask you, you're the lawyer here. Is the proper remedy prohibition? Or is it, pro, is it a prohibitory injunction? Or are they the same? Janet, are you around? Has she dropped out? Oh, Janet is still there. No, I'm, I'm still here. I'm actually looking. Um, okay. I am thinking about it as, you, as you're speaking. The prohibition is discretionary and under the um, uh, prohibition is a writ issued by the court to restrain discretionary restrain from exceeding its powers prohibiting further unlawful action or exercising its powers breach of natural justice it's available on the grounds of want or excess of jurisdiction breach of natural ju justice the equitable re remedy generally only when an alternative remedy is not available but it had to meet three criteria a serious question to be tried or that the plaintiff has made out a prima facie case uh, that he will suffer irreparable 
injury for which damages will not be adequate compensation unless an injunction is granted, and three, that the balance of convenience favours the granting of an injunction. So, in a final this, written, in a final I still written, can't... In a final written online assessment, if all, you need, if, if all you're doing is to restate for me what's in the lecture notes, that's not going to work. Yeah. So, yeah, the, the question is... What's the difference here? Are they the same actually? Mandrew, is one for the benefit of an individual as opposed to the other being for the public on a more broader scale? Um, no. No. Okay. <laughs> Just stabbing in the dark. <laughs> in fact, in relation to the equity, oh, so we, we said that the common law writs are typically called prerogative writs because they are subject to the discretion of the courts whether they grant it or not. Are we saying that equitable writs are not subject to the discretion of the courts to issue? They are not discretionary? Is that the way you distinguish the two on the basis of whether or not one is discretionary and the other one is not? Meaning courts are compulsorily required to issue a, an equitable remedy? Okay, let me, just provide, let me just provide the answer there, if it's all right. Are we, are, are we about ready, you know, or do you, you want to try to stand in the dark still? I mean, that's fine. But what I'm doing here is to make you think. So in the test, you know, you don't end up just restating for me what's already in the, in the notes. That doesn't tell me much. It's called synthesis. Being able to compare and contrast would be one, not by restating what's there, but you know, putting in your own words what the key distinctions are. Because sometimes there could be a difference, but they're not substantial differences. So it's a distinction based on an important... Uh, okay, if it's all right, I'd like to uh, have a discussion here. So, I mean, I'd like to say something here. So the thing about the common law Okay, so we already know that as far as the uh, ADGR Act is concerned, it's quite limited. So I'm just summarizing it a bit now. Because under the ADGR Act, it's mainly concerned, the, the relief there essentially is about affirming the decision or quashing it or setting it aside. There's nothing, not much that you know, else can be done by the court. So it's quite a very limited uh, power that's given under the ADGR Act. Now in this case, um, if... You know, you, you've got a problem with um, the attempt to garnish. So you probably want to you, you probably want to do something more than just having the decision set aside because it's possible that in the meantime, if there's a, a question of whether or not there was in fact a misinterpretation of the law or whether or not there was in fact a problem with natural justice, you know, the ATO will garnish your funds by then. You know what I mean? So the problem with the ADGR Act is because you're going to the courts through the ADGR Act, there's a problem of evidence. And so therefore, you know, there has to be proof of uh, whether there was a breach of natural justice, how much of the correct computation should be, and so on. And that might take time. Apart from the fact that the, uh, the, the judicial relief is quite limited. On the other hand, if you pursue the common law writs, and especially if you, sue, if, if you pursue the equitable writs, chances are they are meant to be faster because if you can show, for example, that there is a great danger of a violation of your rights and that, for example, the mere payment of damages will be insufficient uh, for you to recover whatever damage uh, has been inflicted upon yourself, then in that case, uh, you know, you, you need to apply either for a common law writ or an equitable writ. Now, how exactly are the two different? And where, how, why did the equitable remedy, and we're going, do, uh, we're going back a bit historically for us to have a better sense of what the difference of the two is. The thing about um, the common law writ is that it is actually a, a writ that was developed by the courts for the purpose of addressing 
some of the excesses of the uh, of the of the king then or of the executive however after a while the common law writs uh, became more or less calcified and became rigid rules so that for example prohibition is only available in these instances and that's the only thing you can do okay very rigid these are the rules you must meet them if you know uh, among the among the requirements that you need to meet is to sh is to show that there is no other remedy available if there is a remedy that's available such as going to the by appealing to the head of the ATO or by going to the AAT prohibition is unavailable under the common law writ of prohibition are we clear that is rigid so if you can go to the head of the department or if you can go to the treasurer or if you can go to the AAT prohibition is out because under the strict rigid rules of common law writs because they're rigid they became although it's common law made by judges after a while you know the, it became calcified into specific rigid rules which needed to be followed and so that's one of the first things that you need to show and the problem as well is that it's prohibition it's meant, meant simply to stop and perhaps you need more than just stopping somebody you know what i mean now what about a prohibitory injunction the advantage of an equitable remedy and it's also a discretionary remedy by the way the advantage of an equitable remedy is that the the main purpose of an equitable equitable remedy is actually to promote equity fairness justice and so on that's the reason and so in other words after a while um, the equity became a source for the courts of chancery meaning the courts under the king straight directly under the king to remedy injustices as a result of the rigid common of, as, a, as, a, as a result of the rigid common law writs that were available by the courts so because as i said the the you know the the common law writs had become classified in specific rules and principles if your specific facts did not meet those uh, specific um, requirements it was unavailable then you went you went to the king or the, to the course of the chancery which were under the king to make an appeal that even if your case did not meet the requirements of the courts you know as a court of chancery please using equity and fairness hear my case are we getting are we getting it clear so far now at some point obviously the courts or the common law courts also became courts of equity because the courts of chancery disappeared through time so actually when you say that, that a court of law is also a court of equity that's exactly the point because a court of it's a court of law both on the basis of statute and on the basis of common law principles but it is also on the basis of equitable principles and equitable principles are kind of more flexible now so therefore the advantage of an equitable remedy is that in those cases where a writ of prohibition is unavailable as a common law writ because your requirements your, your specific facts don't meet them your recourse will be an equitable remedy okay now equitable remedy is more open in the sense that it determines even if it doesn't meet the requirements of a common law writ it might be uh, open to uh to an equitable writ being to being issued that's one two the equitable writ is more directed to ensuring that where there is grave and irreparable injury that is unlikely to be recompensed merely by a monetary damage or a monetary award which common law courts would typically pay then an equitable remedy is more important like in this case it might be a question of a problem with his reputation so for the purpose of protecting and enhancing the reputation of Darren Wilkins because he's running a business then it is essential that prohibitory injunction actually be uh, be ordered by the court okay now more importantly prohibition as we said is limited because it just stops you know a decision maker or an executive from doing something on the other hand if it is a an equitable remedy of prohibitory injunction the nature of an equitable remedy it is is that it is meant to suit and adjust itself 
according to the facts of the case. And because of that, if the court sees that there is a need to do something more than just stopping the, um, the ATO, it can require the ATO to do something else to ensure that equity and justice has been served. Are we clear about that? That other, the last part there? So if it is an equitable remedy of prohibitory injunction, it goes beyond stopping or restraining an executive decision maker. It actually looks into, you know, what other remedies can the court do that, that specifically meet, meets the requirements of that specific case. So in this case, it might be that, you know, it can order the ATO even, you know, can you look, can you do this, can you do that? Are we clear about that? Clear? Okay. So the answer here is the appropriate remedy would be uh, an equitable remedy of uh, prohibit inter an interlocutory prohibitory injunction is the appropriate remedy here. Now the high court, um, now the high court Prohibition is unavailable, as we said, because um, there is uh, a possible uh, administrative process that's available, an, an administrative appeal that's available, in which case you can go to the head of the department, you can probably go to the treasurer, you can even go to the AAT. In that case, the prohibition will not be granted. Obviously, it's not mandamus because there's nothing, there is no uh, legal right that you're hoping the um, the executive decision maker is meant to uh, is meant to, uh, to to honor or observe or respect. Okay, so it's seven o three. The final question actually was that you know there is no legal remedy. I could have changed the facts here, but we're kind of running out of time. It's seven o three, and um, Josh has to go, and my daughter has started to cry. So I think if you're happy, we had a thorough discussion of this question. The second question, the answer is actually, uh, no, unfortunately, judicial remedy is not available. And I, I, I could have changed the facts, but it will take another 15, 20 minutes of discussion. I don't know if you should do that still. Up to you. What do you think? Manjo, I'm happy with what we've covered so far tonight. Okay, so we could probably end it tonight. We're happy to go, it's a Friday, and uh, my daughter has been crying already. So um, if everyone is happy for us to end tonight's session, I thank you for joining us again, and uh, I'll see you next week. Oh, by the way, if you could, please uh, do something about the survey before it closes. It's important that the students are asked to kind of do something about the survey. So if you could, you know, have a say in the survey, you know, which is in Moodle, I'd be grateful for that, especially if you say something nice about me or the course, okay? So thank you, and I'll see you next week. Uh, have a great long weekend. Bye.